And now it's time for us to discuss more of these headlines and simple keywords with Adam joining us via Zoom. Good morning, Adam. Well, good morning, Lena. Happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday. Let's start out at today's uh, a keyword news portion with a coverage of North Korean provocation. So this is our first keyword of the day. Tactical nuclear drills. So North Korean leader Kim Jong-un says the regime's recent flurry of missile launches were tactical nuclear drills aimed at testing its capabilities of striking targets. This is causing more concern that the North could be nearer to conducting another nuclear test for weeks. It seems that experts have pointed that it's imminent. It would be a part of Kim Jong-un's long-term goals. So what's the latest, Adam? Yeah, so these provocations and the rhetoric that's coming out from the North is pointing more towards that possibility of another nuclear test, unfortunately. And state media says Kim Jong-un oversaw military drills staged by what he called nuclear tactical operation units from September 25th to October 9th. So in the space of two weeks when a lot of missiles were being launched mm -hmm. by the North Korean regime. And it said the drills were to check and assess the deterrence and nuclear counterattack capabilities as well as send a severe warning to what state media called the enemies. Uh, now, the report said the drills included simulated nuclear strikes on airports in South Korea, tests of underwater missile silos and rocket attacks on seaports. So uh, it's specifically mentioning that one of the targets is South Korea, which is causing concern here in Seoul. Now, it said the moves were responses also to US-led naval exercises um, also, the KCNA reported that the missile that flew over Japan on October 4th was a new ground-to-ground -ground intermediate range ballistic missile. Uh, Kim also reaffirmed his opposition to negotiations with the U.S. as well. Uh, last month, he declared that North Korea would never give up nuclear arms or denuclearize first. So it seems like he's putting the ball in the U.S. Uh, and South Korea's court. Mm. Uh, but U.S. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby told ABC this week that Washington's offer for talks still stands, but he noted that the U.S. had the capabilities to respond if Kim chose to escalate. Also here in Korea, Seoul's presidential office said the Korean Peninsula and Northeast Asia are facing a grave security situation. So tensions between the two Koreas and the U.S. and North Korea are ongoing. All right, let's move on to our economy section. In the meanwhile, this is our second keyword of the day. Debt default. With economic hardships increasing amongst the public, recent data shows that a lot of people are struggling to pay back their debts. We alluded to some of the data yesterday, but we have further details. Adam, can you tell us about the report? Sure. So uh, Bank of Korea data shows that some 380,000 households were found to be at high risk of financial default due to excessive debt burdens as of last year. Of course, those were exacerbated by the pandemic as well. A lot of people taking out loans just to simply just get by. Uh, and the BOK report was submitted to Kang Jun hyun of the main opposition Democratic Party. Now, the BOK defines such households as those that are unable to pay back their loans even through the disposal, disposal or sale of their entire assets. So whether it be your car or your house, if they sell everything that they have, they're still not able to pay back uh, their loans. And the latest study represents 3.2% of all households with debts. Uh, it's actually lower than the 403,000 that was recorded in 2020, but it's mm. slightly higher than the figure posted before the pandemic. Um, the combined debt volume of high-risk households as of last year also amounted to 69 trillion won. That's just over 6% of the country's entire debt liabilities. And also with the BOK set to raise its key rate by 50 basis points tomorrow, uh, that would mean even more of a burden for such households as well. What they would have to pay back would increase even further, putting them in a further financial, I guess, personal crisis, I suppose. Uh, how will the government address these growing concerns? We'll wait and see. Let's move on to our pandemic coverage of the day. This is our third keyword. Bivalent vaccines. Curry begins inoculation using bivalent COVID-19 vaccines beginning today. They come amid fears of a so-called twindemic in the colder months. We're getting reports of a lot of flu patients uh, this fall. So what should we know at this point in time? 
Yeah, I fell victim to uh, influenza recently <laughs> as well. So I know that, uh, yeah, this pandemic is coming. Uh, Moderna's bivalence COVID-19 vaccine, for example, will be used for the first time as a booster in the country. Uh, the bivalent vo- uh, COVID-19 vaccine developed by Pfizer will be used after completion of the regulatory process. And the bivalent COVID-19 vaccine will be the first uh, will be first available uh, for people at high risk and in other vulnerable groups, including those aged 60 and above. They will also be for workers and patients at facilities that are vulnerable to infections. Uh, people have been quick to make reservations for it. Uh, reservations in high-risk groups as of Friday was just under 300,000. Uh, adults 18 to 60 can also reserve leftover bivalent COVID-19 vaccines on a daily basis. That's if they have completed their primary series of vaccinations. Uh, They can make reservations by checking directly with local hospitals or through mobile applications. Uh, Mobile reservations, however, start at 4 p.m. tomorrow, so not today. Um, Health officials note that anyone who is trying to receive the bivalence vaccines should wait 120 days since their last vaccine. Mm -hmm. Anyone who has contracted COVID-19 must also wait 120 days from Mm -hmm. their infection before receiving boosters as well. So do take note of that if you're interested. Uh, The government's recent efforts to increase the booster rate, of course, as you mentioned, comes amid the growing possibility of this combined COVID-19 and influenza or so-called twindemic. Uh, according to the KDCA, more people have recently shown flu-like symptoms. Uh, Korea's flu season normally starts in November and goes through April, but of course that is just a very a wide ballpark and it could change um, this year, especially with the COVID-19 still mm. lingering around with the Omicron variant as well, which these bivalent vaccines are also targeting as well. Mm. So wait, uh, at the very least, four months since your last vaccination or since you came ill to COVID-19 to get these bivalent vaccines, mm. if it's available to you, I still have a month to go, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the war in Ukraine. This is our fourth keyword of the day. Russian attack. So tensions and violence have escalated to new heights in Ukraine as Russia launched its biggest attack on Kiev and other Ukrainian cities. What's the latest? Yeah, so we had a bit of a few months uh, of a bit of uh, not so escalated tensions, but now uh, Russia has launched what is or what has been its uh, biggest barrage of attacks uh, since its war on Ukraine in February. Um, they were apparently in response to a weekend attack Moscow blamed on Ukraine that seriously damaged a bridge connecting Russia to the occupied Crimea. That bridge is actually a key route for military supplies for uh, the war. Uh, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said Russia had carried out dozens of strikes using missiles, as well as Iranian-made drones, uh, to target the country's electrical grid and other civilian infrastructure. And he said his country was dealing with terrorists. Uh, Ukraine says at least 14 people have been killed across the country, including at least five in Kyiv, which hasn't been hit actually since June. It's also the closest strike to the center of the city since the war began, coming just over a thousand yards actually from Zelensky's office. Mm. Um, Ukraine's national broadcaster reported that at least 16 cities sustained attacks. Several regions were left without electricity and water supply was also affected. Uh, Rescue efforts, though, across Ukraine were slowed due to repeated volleys of explosives coming from the sky. Um, Russian President uh, Vladimir Putin said the strikes were a necessary response to what he argued were repeated terrorist attacks by Ukraine on critical Russian infrastructure, including that bridge that Mm. I mentioned. And he added that his response will be harsh and its scale will correspond to the level um, of threats. Uh, Meanwhile, the leader of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko has ordered his troops to deploy with Russian forces near Ukraine. He claims uh, Ukraine and NATO are planning to launch an attack on his country, but offered no evidence. So that could be a signal of more tensions and violence to come. Mm. And finally, let's move on to our last keyword of the day. Visa-free travel. So Japan is finally opening its borders to individual tourists from today. Group tours were allowed even during those strict restrictions, but this means you can travel alone to Japan now. Yeah. Koreans are rushing to book tickets. What's the latest, Adam? 
That's right. A lot of people do travel alone to Japan, mm. myself included. I've, I've done that plenty of times uh, before, and now that uh, is returning. And for the first time in two years and seven months, in fact, Japan is lifting its suspension of visa-free entry. It applies to 68 regions and countries, including Korea, of course, and the U.S. Uh, Koreans are able to stay in Japan for up to 90 days without a visa for tourism or visiting res relatives as well as for business mm. as well. Uh, Japan is also lifting a daily cap of 50,000 arrivals and tourists are no longer limited to group or package tours. Mm -hmm. uh, antivirus measures will also be simplified as well. To enter, visitors must have received at least three shots of a vaccine approved by the WHO. Uh, if they have not, they must present a negative COVID-19 PCR test taken within 72 hours of departure. Mm -hmm. Visitors are not required to take a COVID test after arrival or go into quarantine. So you can go straight to your itinerary as soon as you arrive. Mm -hmm. In the event of suspected COVID-19 uh, symptoms, though, the Japanese government recommends travelers to get uh, tested at uh, and isolate as an accommodation designated by the government if results are positive. Um, this border opening is causing, as you'd expect, a rush of ticket <laughs> sales. Uh, Hana Tour, the largest uh, travel agency in Korea, said bookings to Japan, get this, increased by 776% on month in September. <laughs> uh, trips to Japan accounted for 36% of reservations made last month. Mm. Um, uh, and that's considering that Japan at that time hadn't opened the borders yet. Uh, and Very Good Tour, another travel agency, saw its sales of Japan trips rise by 500% in September <laughs> from the previous month. I was planning to go to Japan actually either this month or uh, next month. I, look, I saw the ticket prices. And now I'm a bit hesitant. <laughs> <laughs> a simple rules of supply and demand. When supply yeah. runs low and demand runs high, what do you yeah. do? You throw money at it. And <laughs> maybe you can wait it out just a tad bit longer. Uh, maybe next yeah. year we'll try again. Uh, I'm waiting out the wave just for a little bit. So I'm going to I'm gonna keep my eye on the prices. But at the moment, wow, they're, they have certainly skyrocketed. Yeah. We've been so deprived. I mean, a 776% jump on month that sounds yeah. kind of out of this world but you get the gist yeah. of the story people have been <laughs> deprived japan is close enough for korean travelers there was we had a lot of frequent visitors and has returned it's clearly good news for the struggling tourism industry in japan as well right so thank is. you very much adam for today's coverage have a safe day we'll speak to you again tomorrow you too you're very welcome see you tomorrow if you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.